is seven o'clock. Welcome, you guys. Thank you for joining via Zoom tonight. Um, the one good thing about us meeting on Zoom is that we are able to record our lecture. So I will be able to post that up on YouTube and put that link up later tonight. So you'll have it to be able to study with. The lecture that I am using is the same exact lecture that is on Canvas. So you'll be able to study from that easily. You'll have the same information that I'm talking about tonight. Oh, lots of people are joining right now. Okay. Lots of people just joined. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about today is joints and the joints of the upper appendage. Another person joining us. Okay. Well, let's see. It is just after seven. So I'm going to wait a couple minutes before we do roll, see if there's any more people who join us. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and get started on this. We talked about the bones of the upper appendage on Monday, it's Wednesday today. So we're gonna talk about the joints in general and then the joints of the upper appendage. Oh, and yes, because it's Zoom, I'm gonna yawn. I'm sorry, I will try not to yawn. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about articulations, which is a scientific term for joints. So articulations, these are where body movements occur at joints. So joint is an articulation. This is where two bones come in contact with each other. <clears throat> joint structure determines the direction and the distance. I told you I was gonna yawn. I don't know why. I'm sorry. So joint structure determines the direction that you're able to move that joint and the distance you're able to move within that joint, so your range of motion. So, so certain joints give you a lot of range of motion, like your shoulder, you can move it quite a bit. Whereas if you think about your elbow, you're only able to move it in one plane because it is a hinge joint. So an important point to remember is that joint strength decreases as mobility increases. And this is a really important point for you to keep in mind. I'm going to go grab my pen real quick. If you can just bear with me for just a second while I grab that. I am trying to figure out how to pause real quick. Okay, I'll be right back. Got my trusty pen here so that we can, I can write on the screen for you. Okay, so I really wanted to highlight this part, this part here that joint strength decreases as the mobility increases. So the more mobile a joint, the less integrity it has, the easier it is to injure it. The less movement there is, the stronger the joint is. Okay, classification of joints. Two methods of classification. First, functional classification. This is based on the range of motion of the joint. So how much movement that joint is able to have. And then secondly, 
structural classification. This is how is the joint made? How is it organized? How is it built? So we'll be talking about both of these before we get into the joints of the upper arm or the upper appendage. Okay, functional classifications. And these are terms that you're gonna to wanna to know. So again, this first portion of this lecture there is some memorization for you and flashcards again, fantastic method for learning. All of, um, a lot of this stuff from this lecture is not in your top hat homework. So this is kind of in addition to the top hat homework, which is not very much for the upper appendage joint. It's just a page and a half. So this is talking about all joints first and then joints of the upper appendage. So we have some background work that we're doing tonight before we get into the upper arm, into the arm. Okay, when it's with a synarthrosis, this is an immovable joint, which means there's no movement that occurs. So this is where you have two bones that come together that are fixed. And this is going to be a very strong joint because there is no movement. So typically you're going to find that there are fibrous or cartilaginous connections with these types of joints. Some examples would be the pubic symphysis between the two pubic bones right in the front in the pubic region um, or with the cartilage and the bone in your ribs. Some of these may fuse over time and become completely immovable. An amphiarthrosis, this is a joint that is slightly movable. So some movement is possible. Not very much though. Again, fibrous or cartilaginous connections. The next classification I'm sorry, was there a question? No? Okay. The next, uh, next classification is a diarthrosis, which is a freely movable joint. And this is typically what we think of when we think about a joint. We're thinking about movable joints. So much more movement is possible with a diarthrosis. And we can also call these synovial joints and pretty much all of the joints of the upper arm or the upper appendage are going to be synovial joints. So we're gonna to wanna to pay special attention to the diarthrosis joints. These can be subdivided into the type of motion that they can accommodate. And there are six types of motion or six types of classifications of synovial joints, which we will talk about. We'll have examples of those. So here is a great summary slide. This talks about structural category right here on the left, whether it's a bony joint, a fibrous joint, a cartilaginous joint, or a synovial joint. The next Functional category, so synarthrosis, amphiarthrosis, or diarthrosis. So if you remember, we back up real quick, a synarthrosis is an immovable joint. An amphiarthrosis is slightly movable, and a diarthrosis is freely movable, or we can also call that, as we see that there, synovial, I can't spell today, synovial. <laughs> Sorry, joint. Okay, then what we're going to talk about next is structural type. So we'll talk about these terms. What is syntosis, suture, gomphosis, syndesmosis, synchondrosis, symphysis, all of those mean. And then we'll spend some time talking about the types of synovial joints. And these are what we want to we want to make sure we understand these and we'll spend some extra time on them as we talk about the joints in the upper appendage. 
Okay, I can't see the screen. Okay, classification of joints. So first classification, bony joints. Fibrous joints. This is with dense connective fibrous tissue. So a great example of a fibrous joint is between the sutures and the skull. And these sutures, they're like little, fing like little fingers of bone that interconnect with each other. And in between those fingers are little bit of fibers that are holding those fingers together, holding that suture together very strongly. And so this is not a movable joint. This is a fixed joint, or let's use the correct term. So if it's not a movable joint, it's going to be a synothrosis right here, talking about sutures in the skull, synothrosis. Okay, a gonphosis. These, um, a great place to find a gonphosis would be the teeth in their sockets. Those roots that are down into the jaw of your mandible or your maxilla, they are held in place by fibers, periodontal ligaments that help hold those bones in place. A gomphosis is an immovable joint, at least you hope so, else your teeth are gonna be moving around in their sockets and you're gonna have trouble. So immovable joint, very strong joint. So remember, the less movement a joint has, the more structural integrity it has. Okay, next is a syndesmosis. So a couple good examples would, between, would be between the tibia and fibula of the lower appendage of your leg or between the radius and the ulna in your forearm. So we'll have a picture of that coming up later. But a syndesmosis is a sheet of connective tissue that holds two bones together. So if we back up, a syndesmosis right here, that's the structural type, a sheet of connective tissue. A syndesmosis is an amphiothrosis joint, which means there is some movement. Not a lot like with a diathrosis, but there is some movement. Okay, next, cartilaginous joints. So one example of a cartilaginous joint is a synchondrosis. So this portion of the word con refers to cartilage. So whenever you see that prefix or that portion of the word con, C-H-O-N, it's talking about cartilage. So a synchondrosis is a cartilaginous joint between the ribs and the cartilage. And you find this the lower portion of your rib cage, you have cartil cartilage that joins the bones of the ribs up to the sternum. Okay, another type of joint, a symphysis. Um, this is a fibrocartilage joint. So if you remember, there's three types of cartilage. We have hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage, and fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage is very tough, very strong. Um, places that you find this is in between the vertebra of your, of your spinal cord, spinal column, and it provides cushion and support. And the pubic symphysis, this is that one I was referring to earlier between the two pubic bones right there at the base of your pelvic cavity. This is typically an immovable joint, but there is times where there can be movement. So with intervertebral discs, there is gonna be movement of your vertebral column. If you're moving your back side to side, front to, front to back, you have a lot of ability to move. Um, so there is some movement there. With the pubic symphysis down there at the base of your pelvic cavity, joining those two pelvic bones together, 
that's typically immovable. But with women who are pregnant late in their pregnancy, their body starts releasing a hormone called relaxin, and that loosens up that joint, that pubic symphysis joint, so that when she is actually in childbirth, there's a little bit of give when she's trying to push that baby through the birth canal. That pubic symphysis gives a little bit to allow more room during childbirth. Okay, then the fourth classification is the synovial joint. This is where you have a joint capsule and within the joint capsule there's fluid called synovial fluid. And this is kind of a slippery fluid that allows um, that reduces friction, allows those bones to slip past each other freely with as little friction as possible. So these are freely movable joints. There are going to be six classifications of synovial joints. The first is a pivot joint. And just so you know, I put up a link for a video that talks about the six types of synovial joints up on Canvas. And it's actually an art video talking about how to illustrate art, but it talks specifically about the six classifications of joints, and it does a very good job taking you through each classification with examples. So I would highly encourage you to take that time to look at that video, watch it. I think it's about 10 minutes long, but it's really great um, breaking down those synovial joints and the type of movement, how those joints are constructed, how the movement occurs. Okay, pivot joint. This is monoaxial, which means it only moves in one axis. So thinking back, about the body planes. We had our transverse plane, we had our sagittal plane, and our frontal slash coronal plane. In a pivot joint, it's only moving in one of those planes. So a really great example is your forearm. Your radius and the ulna have the ability to pivot around each other. It's a great pivot joint. but it only is able to do that in one plane. A hinge joint is also monoaxial, only able to move in one direction, one plane. Great example would be the elbow. It's a great hinge. We spent time talking about how that elbow is constructed on Monday. It's a perfect hinge joint. The knee is another great hinge joint. Toes and fingers are also hinge joints. They are able to move in one plane. This finger joint can move up and down, but it cannot, at these joints, move side to side, for example. It can only move in one direction. Okay, the next type is a saddle joint, and there's only one type of saddle joint in the body, and that is with your thumb at the metacarpal phalangeal joint right here. And so we'll spend some time talking about this a little bit more. Um, I've watched several short videos. I can't decide on which one's the best one that talks about all the type of movement that can occur at the saddle joint, but it is a unique joint. And so it says that it is biaxial, two axes it can move in. Then ellipsoid joints, also biaxial, so moving it in two axes or in two dimensions. So your wrist or your knuckles. Ball and socket joints. These are multi-axial, which mean you can move into many different planes. So a great example of a ball and socket joint would be your shoulder. And we spent time talking about the structure of your shoulder on Monday. 
but the head of the humerus has that nice smooth surface, fits right into the glenoid cavity or fossa, and it allows it to have almost free rotation within that socket. It's shaped basically like a ball fitting into a socket. So you have free movement within that structure. Okay, then a plane joint. Um, places where you would find these would be the short bones of the hand and the foot and the hip and the spine. So thinking about the body of the vertebra, they're, they're kind of, um, they're flat. The surfaces of them where they are moving is flat. And so that's a plane joint where you're able to move in many different directions because it's the bones are sliding past each other. Okay. Functional classifications, synarthrosis, synarthrosis. <laughs> these are immovable joints. Because they are immovable, these joints are incredibly strong. So remember what we said earlier, the strength of the joint determines, or the movability of the joint determines its strength. The more flexible a joint is, the more movable it is, it loses some strength, loses some integrity. So with a synarthrosis, which is an immovable joint, like think about the sutures in the skull or your teeth in their sockets, these are very strong joints. This is where the bone, edges of bones, sorry, I heard a noise. Edges of the bones, sorry, that's the dog. Edges of the bones may interlock or touch with each other. And that allows a very strong connection where they're not going to move. Okay, four types of synarthrotic joints. The suture. Where do we find the suture? Somebody be brave or you can put in it. The skull. In the skull. The skull. In the skull. Yes, exactly. A gomphosis. Where do we find that? Our teeth. Oh, in your teeth. Teeth. Yep. Synchondrosis. So look at the this key portion of the word here. C H O N con. What does that refer to? Cartilage. Cartilage. So this is going to be between bone and cartilage. So a great place would be the rib cage. And then syntosis, which I'm drawing a blank on at the moment for syntosis. So if someone remembers, speak up. Syntosis. I always forget something, so I apologize. Let's back up because I don't want to be the bad teacher here. Why is it not there? Oh, syntosis. It is a bony joint. Okay. This would be where the bones fuse. So an example, bones that fuse, when you were young, your sacrum was not fused. They were separate vertebra. But as you aged up until about the age of 25, it depends on the person, those bones fuse together to a full sacrum, which is kind of a V shape, okay? Those fuse as you become a young adult and becomes completely immovable. Okay, synarthrotic joints. These are the slightly movable joints. Wait, did I say that wrong? No. Synarthrotic. So a suture can be slightly movable. I don't know. In lab, are you able to get your hands on actual bones? Have you been able to? 
Just models? Just models. Okay, well, so you know, like where I, I previously taught anatomy and physiology, we had actual human skeletons that we were able to use, which was cool. They were old, so they were kind of getting beat up. But it was with neat. COVID, they're not letting us touch anything. I, I know COVID is really messing things up. I am so sorry because getting your hands on models and skeletons is so helpful when you're learning this stuff. Um, but the sutures, as I mentioned before, they're kind of interlocking little fingers of bones interlocking between, let's say we're talking about the two parietal bones interlocking at the top of our head. They're little tiny bony fingers interlocking with each other. And then you have little fibers that connect and hold those fingers together. Technically speaking, those bones are, they, when you're holding an actual human skull, those fibers are no longer there and those sutures actually can move a little bit. But when we're alive and we have all of the tissues that are there and those fibers holding those sutures together, they are not movable. If that helps kind of explain the difference a little bit. So sutures, remembering that those bones are interlocking. They're like puzzle pieces coming together. Then you have little fibers like glue that hold them tightly together so that there's not movement. So they're connected by dense connective tissue fibers. Only find these in the skull. And pretty much I mean, yes, you have the major sutures that we've talked about, like the sagittal suture, lambdoid suture, the occipital, no, that's not occipital, um, lambdoid, occipital, sagittal. There are more sutures, but all, even all the facial bones are sutures. You only find these in the skull. Gomphosis. Where do you think the only place we find gomphosis joints? Your mouth. Yes, your mouth, the teeth. And these are fibrous connections held in place by periodontal ligaments. So next time you go to your dentist, you can show off your knowledge about gomphosis joints and they'll be like, whoa, they'll be impressed. So, you know, I went to the doctor yesterday because I was having some pain in my sacral region and she was trying to explain the anatomy. I said, I teach anatomy. She's oh, good. Then you know all this stuff. Turns out, guys, this is a real thing. I have sacroiliitis, which is an inflammation between the sacral joint and the ilium, which is the pelvic bone. It's probably from my bad office chair gonna guess getting a new chair in a couple days but it's not fun it doesn't feel good <laughs> but it's a real life condition between two joints that are actually inflamed and that's typically an immovable joint as well but you can irritate the joint and it can hurt they're still letting you work in the office no I'm working at home I have a really okay. yucky office chair at home and I'm ordering a new chair that's coming on Friday, thank goodness. And I think I'll feel a lot better after then because sitting too long hurts and then standing too long hurts. So I'm looking forward to some relief soon. Did you not, did you not take the ones in the office that they let us take home? They wouldn't let me take my office chair home. Oh, I asked goodness. and they wouldn't let me. Wow. So I had to buy my own. After this whole thing flared up, I was like, okay, I need to buy a new chair. So the things you learn during COVID. Yeah. Okay. So we did our gomphosis. Synarthrotic joints. So a synarthrotic joint 
One type is a synchondrosis. So that con means what? Cartilage. Cartilage. Yes, you guys are going to rock this chapter. I can tell. So it is a cartilaginous bridge or connection between two bones. One of the great places you'll find this is between the bones of your ribs and your sternum. So not all your ribs do not directly connect to the sternum, which is the bone, your breastbone. There is a, a, a cartilaginous bridge between the rib and the sternum for all of those. So that is all of those connections are synchondrosis. Okay, one of the places you find this is between long bones. So kids who are still growing, they have growth plates. Those growth plates are called episphial plates. And that part of the bone where it's still growing lengthwise is made out of cartilage. So technically speaking, that cartilage is a bridge between the end of the bone and the long part of the bone where it's still growing. The other place I just mentioned is between the ribs and the sternum, so the vertebral sternal ribs. Oh, then a syntosis. These are fused bones, bones that are immovable completely. So as I mentioned before, the sacrum fuses as you age from being individual sacral vertebra to a fused V-shaped bone. Um, there is a suture in the skull called the mitopic suture that fuses entirely. So it's no longer a suture, it's completely fused over. That's not a bone that you guys learn or a suture that you need to learn. But it's just kind of a, so you know that is a syntosis. Okay, after you're done growing, so remember I was telling you the growth plates, the epispheal plates, when you've stopped growing, that cartilaginous epispheal plate fuses and becomes solid bone. Once that happens, you can no longer grow in height anymore. But that connection, that line where that episphial plate used to be, is a syntosis. When we talk, I think we'll spend some more talking about bones as we continue on and we'll go over the actual structure of that. Okay, amphiothrosis. These are more movable than synothrosis, stronger than a freely movable joint. So these are kind of like the middle of the road as, um, as far as strength is concerned. Two types of amphiothrosis. You have a syndesmosis. I know there's a lot of terms today, but you guys can do this. You have a syndesmosis. These are bones connected by ligaments. Then you have a symphysis, which is where bones are separated by fibrous cartilage. So the pubic symphysis is a great example. And a lot of our bones are connected by ligaments. Ligaments help add strength, structural integrity to joints, especially joints that are freely movable like our synovial joints. Water time. We can do this because we're not wearing masks. That's a great thing about Zoom is I can see your faces. Okay, synovial joints. These are our freely movable joints or our diarthrosis. We find these at the ends of long bones. So 
you may quickly think of, so we talked about our humerus and our radius and ulna, those are long bones, but even the fingers are long bones. Your toes are long bones. A lot of the bones in your body are considered long bones. Within a synovial joint, you have articular capsules, which is where that joint is there is a capsule of connective tissue that surrounds the joint that's filled with synovial fluid. That's why they're called synovial joints. So the membrane that kind of holds this joint and the fluid within it together is called a synovial membrane. That synovial membrane secretes that synovial fluid, which is slippery, that you find within the synovial joint. <clears throat> okay, components of a synovial joint. Articular cartilage. So you're always going to find cartilage within a joint. Where two bones come together, it's not bone rubbing on bone because that's gonna be painful. You're gonna have a cartilage lining the ends of these bones that are in contact with each other. We call that articular cartilage. Um, not only do they pad the surfaces of the bone, so they're directly connected to the surface of the bone, so they help pad those two bones, um, they have more functions than just doing that. So they prevent the bones from touching, so somebody, for example, who has osteoarthritis, that articular cartilage has worn down and the bone is starting to rub on bone, which is incredibly painful. Okay, those smooth surfaces, so the cartilage that lines the surface of the bones that are in contact with each other, that cartilage is very smooth. It, it doesn't feel soft, but it does provide cushioning. And then you have the synovial fluid, which is slick and slippery, which allows those bones to slide past each other very easily. So reducing friction is one of the major functions of synovial fluid. Okay. Was that what? Did you draw on the screen, Antoinette? I'm, I'm amused. Okay, synovial fluid. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> synovial fluid, so what makes it slippery? Proteoglycans that are secreted by fibroblasts. Um, that's kind of more the physiology part of it. Just know, oh, someone else is here. Just know that fibroblasts are what secrete the synovial fluid. Whoops. Okay, functions of the synovial fluid. We know that it already reduces friction, so it acts as a lubricant. also helps distribute nutrients throughout that articular capsule. Um, there's not a huge blood supply within the joint itself. So that synovial fluid kind of acts as a nutrient distribution point. So it's distributing nutrients to the cartilage itself because cartilage in general does not have a good blood supply at all. So the synovial fluid helps with that. Synovial fluid also helps with shock absorption. So not only does the articular cartilage that's on the ends of the bones help with shock absorption, but the fluid itself, the synovial fluid helps as well. Okay, accessory structures that you can find associated with synovial joints, cartilage. Cartilage plays a really important role. I know I've said cartilage like five times already, but it is important. Cushions the joint. So a great example would be the meniscus in your knee. 
you have a fibrocartilage pad that cushions the two bones, so cushions your femur and the tibia, there's a lot of weight that's bearing down on that joint. It's carrying all the weight from above down onto that joint. So there is a thick, tough fibrocartilage pad that helps separate those two bones and provides some cushioning. There are also fat pads. And these are superficial to the joint. Um, so a great example of a fat pad is the popliteal fat pad, which is found behind your knee. If you feel behind your knee or you look behind your knee, there's almost kind of a raised bump behind your knee. That's the fat pad. That's your popliteal fat pad. And that actually helps protect some of the structures of that joint. Without that fat pad, there'd be a big concave indentation in the backside of your knee and ligaments that are helping to hold those two major bones, the fibia, no, sorry, the femur and the tibia together um, are more at risk to being damaged. So that pop little fat pad helps protect those structures helps protect the meniscus, which is that articular cartilage between those two bones. Then you also have ligaments that are associated with synovial joints. And you're gonna learn some ligaments that are associated with the upper appendage today. Ligaments hold bone to bone or connect bone to bone. So they support, they strengthen joints, and they connect bone together. When you have a sprain, this is when a ligament has been torn. A ligament is essentially made up of a bundle of collagen fibers. When you tear that, that is a sprain. I would know that, that's a, that's a good question right there. Okay, more accessory structures. Tendons. Tendons also are an important part, are that important part of a synovial joint. Tendons attach muscle to bone. So attaching muscle around the joint also helps strengthen the joint because you have muscle that runs around the outsides of the joint, which gives it more structural integrity. Okay, then there's also bursa. And bursas are pockets of synovial fluid that help cushion tendons. So wherever a tendon or a ligament will rub near that joint, there's an extra pad of, there's like an out pocketing of that synovial joint where there's extra synovial fluid that cushions the area between the bone and that tendon or ligament. So there's, it's just like a, a little pad of protection. We have pictures coming up. Okay, things that help stabilize synovial joints. So if you limit the range of motion at a joint, you're reducing the amount or the chance of injury at that point. So collagen fibers help stabilize joints. So ligaments are made up of collagen fibers. The joint capsule itself is a connective tissue capsule, that synovial capsule, also helps provide stability. I'm sorry. Okay. The articulating surfaces, so where those two bones are coming together, coated with cartilage, 
and then having that meniscus or that fibrocartilage pad between those two bones provides more stability as well. You have other bones that could be in the vicinity, muscles that wrap around a joint, or fat pads that all add more stability to that joint. Okay, tendons of articulating bones. So remember that tendons connect muscle to bone. So a tendon that wraps around a joint is connecting a muscle to the bone, but is also providing some extra structural support to that joint. Okay, so here we're looking at a couple examples. Um, this top picture is just a generic example of a synovial joint. So take note that the surface of the bone is coated with this white coating. That is the cartilage, the articular cartilage. It's called articular cartilage because it, has, because it is at an articulation, a point between two movable two bones where you have a connection that is an articulation. This joint is surrounded by a synovial membrane which encapsulates the joint, also holds in the synovial fluid. That's the only place you're going to find a synovial fluid is within a synovial joint at a freely movable joint. I apologize, my dog is barking. Just so you all know, his name is Bandito. He's a great little guy. He's a long-haired chihuahua. I love him to death. But if he keeps barking, I'll close the door so you don't have to hear him. I have a question. Zooming. Something's outside. Okay. Looking down here at an actual picture of a joint, this is, we are looking at a mid-sagittal section of the knee joint. Uh, so somebody just said they had a question. Oh, I didn't hear. What was the question? <laughs> okay, so like I've been told in the past that I've um, burst my bursa sac, but I'm uh -huh. seeing that it's at the back of the knee. So what, what, what would that have been then? At the back of your knee is your popliteal fat pad. Um, your bursa is found. So as we're looking at this picture of the knee joint. Okay. So we're looking at the picture of the knee joint. This little structure here would be a yeah. bursa. Or these little structures here. And what they're doing is they're providing cushioning between where a tendon would rub on a bone. Okay, but the bursa's in the back of the knee. What's in the back of the knee, what's not labeled right back here, is your popliteal fat pad. So it is essentially okay. just like a bunch of fat that's protecting the structures in the back of your knee. But if you end up bursting your bursa sac, it can actually fill all the way around to the front? It has, it, it can cause a lot of swelling. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's called bursitis. And I didn't put any pictures of bursitis in here, but let's say you have a bursa that, that is at the tip of your elbow here where your olecranon is. Okay. And people will get a huge swelling at their elbow mm -hmm. because of that, because there's inflammation or they have burst their bursa sac and it's swelling up with synovial fluid and it causes a lot of pain and pressure. Does okay. that sound like what you experienced? Only with my knee, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That doesn't sound fun. No, it, it's not. I'm sorry. Hopefully you're all better now. Yeah. Yeah, I am now. That's good. That's good. So. Good question. Um, Totally forgot where I was, oh, that was a really good question. Oh, I wanted to point out, okay, we've been talking about the meniscus, the fibrocartilage. So note here, this fibrocartilage pad is kind of wedge-shaped. And 
one of your meniscus, there's more than one, but this one I'm looking at here is in the, the posterior of the knee and it is wedge shaped. It's made out of fibro fibrocartilage and it provides cushioning between your femur and your tibia. And it is very strong and it is very tough. But if you've known anybody who's damaged their meniscus, um, it can cause some serious problems. It takes so, like eight months to heal. Yep. Anybody know why it takes so long to heal? Is it because it's a joint you continuously use? That is part of it. But what the big part of it is, is what that meniscus is made out of. It's made out of fibrocartilage. And connective tissue in general does not have a blood supply. If you have a poor blood supply to an area, it's going to take much longer to heal compared to something that has a very good blood supply. Like if you broke your bone, you could take six weeks maybe to heal, maybe less. I broke my elbow falling in the ice many years ago here in Nebraska, yay. Um, but I was out of a sling and moving my arm within three to four weeks. I had to move it to keep up the range of motion. Bl bones have a very good blood supply Whereas right nearby, the cartilage in that articular joint has no blood supply. That's why the synovial fluid acts to help deliver nutrients that they're not getting from the blood. So that's why it takes longer to heal. Okay, we're gonna move on to our next section here. Actually, while we're, let's just take a quick break and do roll real quick since I think everybody's here now. So when I call your name, can you please unmute yourself and let me know that you're here? Amy Barcel. Here. Yes, you were just talking. Danielle. Here. Thank you. Eric. I hear noise. Eric, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Kirsten. Is Kira here? Oh, I see your, your name. Here. Thank you. Miranda. I'm here. Thank you, Miranda. Yep. Grayson. Yeah. Thank you, Grayson. Chelsea. Okay, Jason Hansen, I see your name. Here. Yeah. You're alive, thank you. Madeline. Okay, Ryan. I swear I saw Ryan earlier. Are you still here, Ryan? Hmm, where'd he go? Okay, Macy. Was that Maisie or Macy? Macy Lawler. I'm here. Okay, thank you. Corinne? Madeline, Madeline says she's here. Okay, she thank says you. She's, yeah, and then I'm Corinne, so I'm here too. Did I miss you, Corinne? No, you just called me now. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. Jessica Lucero? Here. Thank you. Elizabeth? I'm here. Thank you. Anna? Here. Thank you. And Jeanette? Here. I think, yeah, I was see, I thought I saw your name earlier. Morgan? Here. Here. Thank you. Olivia? Olivia. Okay, Maisie Shulao. Okay, that's great. Most everybody is here tonight. Thank you for joining us via Zoom. I appreciate it. I don't know if you called my name. Who's that? Can you hear me? 
Yeah. Chelsea, it's just my computer keeps cutting off and I keep getting kicked out of Zoom because of my connection. Oh, to okay. So Chelsea Gomez? I don't know if you guys can hear me. Sorry. Yes, I can hear you. I got you down. Yeah. Okay. That's great. We have almost everybody here tonight. That's awesome. More people than come in class. <laughs> That's a good argument to do Zoom, isn't it? Okay. So some things that can go wrong with synovial joints, because these are the most movable joints in your body. That means they have less structural support and the potential for injury is higher. So let's talk injuries. A dislocation, another term for dislocation is luxation. This is when an articulating surface is forced out of its position. So a really great example right here would be at the knee where the patella is dislocated and moved out of that articulating surface where it would normally be. I used to play flag football in high school, loved it, but I remember once when one of the girls dislocated her knee and it was, it wasn't pretty <laughs> and it looked like it was really painful. Um, we hurt ourselves a lot playing football, we loved it. Okay, so with a dislocation, you can damage a lot of structures, including the articular cartilage, so the cartilage between those two bones, ligaments that are holding the bones together, and the joint capsule itself. That can all become damaged, and tendons, ligaments, joint capsule, all is connective tissue. As we just talked about, that takes much longer to heal. Subluxation, this is a parcel, partial dislocation. Oops, sorry. So this picture here is showing between the vertebra, a subluxation where someone in this example, you have either a misaligned vertebra, a slipped disc where that intervertebral disc has been squished that causes pressure on the spinal nerve that comes out between the vertebra. You put pressure on that nerve because of that slipped disc, there's a lot of pain that occurs from it. Don't most people have subluxations? You can to some degree. Um, back pain is really common, for example. Um, and a lot of it can be subluxation. And so this is where chiropractors get a lot of good business is they help realign the vertebra and relieve that pressure. Um, some people need more than that and have to go do back surgery, orthopedic surgery to relieve the pressure on that vertebra, on that spinal nerve, for example. So there are things that you can do, but it is pretty common, unfortunately. Okay, this is a part where we're gonna have a little bit of review. We've talked about some movements um, before, the different types of body movements, and we're just gonna review those, and then we'll be able to get into the joints of the arm. And I just checked our clock, and we, we may get to the joints today. We may get to them next Monday, um, but we're, we're right on schedule, so I'm not worried. We're doing really good. Okay. Types of motion, linear motion or gliding motion, where bones are gliding past each other. Angular motion, so like with your elbow, that is an angular motion. It's moving at an angle. Think about geometry. Rotation, so like your forearm, rotating the radius and ulna, rotating around each other. Okay, then you also have different body planes of where the motion occurs. So it can be monoaxial, which means it only moves in one axis or one dimension essentially. 
biaxial, which means it moves in two of the axes that we've talked about, or triaxial or multiaxial, more than two axes. Okay, types of movements at synovial joints. So the terms we're gonna talk about, which should be mostly review for you, describes the plane or the direction of motion that is occurring, the relationship between the two structures where movement is occurring, and yeah, those things. <laughs> okay. So linear motion, we'll talk about linear motion, also called gliding. So as I referred to before, where two bones are sliding past each other is a linear motion or a gliding motion. So two surfaces sliding past each other. So good examples would be between the carpal bones of your wrist or the tarsal bones of your ankle there's um you'll have gliding motion that is occurring there angular motion so flexion is when you decrease the angle between two joints so think about somebody flexing their biceps they're decreasing the angle between their radius and ulna and humerus as they flex this is an angular motion. This moves in the anterior posterior plane. I'm not gonna stand up because you won't be able to see me, but think about your body in anatomical position. Your arms are out, your palms are facing forward. If you are bending at the elbow, where is that movement occurring? If your arm is facing forward like it's supposed to, it's going to be in the anterior and posterior plane for flexion. And the whole point or with flexion is, is reducing the angle between those two bones, or actually three bones, because you have two in your forearm and one in your upper arm. Extension on the other hand is the opposite you are increasing the angle between those bones or elements. It still is an angular motion, still moves in an anterior to posterior plane because it's, it's the opposite of flexion and increases the angle. Okay. So here we just have some examples. Hyperextension, I know we didn't talk about this before. With hyperextension, you're, oh, we have Ryan's back. Okay. You're actually moving that joint past its regular position. This is still an angular motion extending past anatomical position. So if we look at this example here, when you bend your neck forward, you are flexing, you're decreasing the angle between your chin and your sternum. You extend it back, so you're upright. If you extend it back further, that is hyperextension past its normal anatomical position. Okay, we've talked about abduction and adduction before, so I'm gonna go quickly through this. This is also an angular motion. Note, if we, we look at this picture here, when she's moving her arm in or out, we have an angle that's formed. Think about geometry. This is moving in the frontal plane. So you move yourself this way, it's moving in this direction. So it's moving away from the longitudinal axis. So if I move my arm out, I'm abducting it. I'm taking it away, like abduction. 
okay? Moving it away from the longitudinal axis of my body. When I bring it back in, that's adduction. I'm adding it back closer to the midline of my body. So just remember that these are angular motions that you find them in, they're in the frontal plane and moves towards the longitudinal axis or towards the midline of your body. Okay, one movement we haven't talked about is circumduction. This is an angular motion. Circumduction you are, can do at a ball and socket joint, which is multi-axial. And this is a movement without rotation. So I would, you know, most of you have your cameras off, so you can try to do this right now without feeling silly, because no one's watching you. See if you can move your arm in a circle, just like shown in this picture, without rotation. See if you can do that. There's a few places where you can do circumduction. At the shoulder joint is one of them. You can also do it at your carpo, I'm sorry. I have to think of the right name. Metacarpal trapezoid, trapezoid joint. I'm not double jointed, so I'm not super flexible, but you can do circumduction there as well. This is still considered an angular motion. Okay, rotation. This is rotation from anatomical position. So if you put your arm in anatomical position, one of the best joints where you have rotation is between the radius and ulna. Look at that joint and rotate, there's two types of rotation. You have lateral rotation where you move your palm out, where your palm ends up facing anteriorly in anatomical position, or medial rotation where your palm, your thumb, turns inwards toward the midline of your body and your palm is facing down. And rotation is relative to the longitudinal axis of your body or the sagittal plane of your body. So that's what it's in reference to, whether it's a lateral rotation with your palm facing out and your thumb lateral to the body, or medial rotation with your palm facing down and your thumb pointing towards the midline of your body. So you can have left or right rotation or lateral or medial rotation. So when we're talking about rotating towards an axis, we're rotating towards that mid-sagittal plane. Supination and pronation. Okay, pronation. Remember that little um, hint I gave you when we talked about this in the beginning of the, this class? We talked about rotating your palm up with supination. Want some soup? Like you're holding a bowl of soup or you're rotating it down that's pronation or think about you're lying prone on the floor with your belly to the floor. So with pronation, your radius and ulna rotate around each other and your, arm, your palm faces downwards or inferiorly. 
With supination, it rotates around each other with your palm facing upwards, like you're holding a bowl of soup. That's also with supination, that's with your palm in anatomical position, which is facing forwards. Okay, some movements we have not talked about. Inversion. So this is with your feet. So most of you guys are sitting at a desk or sitting somewhere. I want you to try to do this with your feet. Twist the sole of your foot medially. So if this is your foot, you want your sole of your foot to rotate it towards the midline of your body. So the sole is pointing down towards the middle of your body. When you rotate it inwards, that's inversion. So a great example is when I was playing basketball, I rolled my ankle. That was an inversion, or my ankle rolled inwards, or my foot rolled in, and my ankle was pointed to the out. It didn't feel very good, but it's a great example of inversion. Eversion is the opposite. So with your foot down towards the ground, you're gonna move the sole of your foot away from the midline of your body, outwards, yeah. laterally. I wish no Gucci. What? Does someone have something to say? I welcome comments, I really do. Okay. It's kind of hard to do. It doesn't naturally want to move in that direction, but it happens. It's usually when you're injuring yourself. Dorsiflexion. So this is with your foot again. This is when you're flexing at the ankle, pointing your toes upwards. So if this, this is your leg and this is your foot, I, I can't bend very well, but your toes are pointing upwards. So where you're sitting, raise up your toes upwards. That's dorsiflexion, where the sole of your foot comes up. Plantar flexion is the opposite when you're pointing your toes, kind of like a ballerina. That's plantar flexion. So you're standing on your tippy toes. Okay, opposition. And this is uh, important for us as we're talking about the upper appendage. This is a movement that only occurs in one place. Your thumb, you, we have opposable thumbs. So we are able to do this type of movement. Can't really do that somewhere else. The grasping motion. Protraction, this is when you're moving anteriorly. So like you're moving forward. So hold your, Think about your head, move your chin forward, move your head forward. You're protracting your head. I'm gonna do it and you're gonna laugh at me. Moving forward, protraction, okay? Retraction is the opposite of protraction. So if you do that silly movement that I did and you protract, you move your chin back and pull it in, that's retraction. Okay, elevation. This is when something moves in a superior direction. So elevation literally thinks about raising up. Depression 
is the opposite of elevation when it's moving in an inferior direction. It's moving down. So let's think about sometime when you were shocked and something happened and you dropped your jaw in surprise, like oh, that movement of dropping your jaw is depression. Picking your jaw back up again, bringing, closing your mouth, elevation. Okay, lateral flexion. So this is with your vertebral column. So if you're bending side to side, you're, you're bending your vertebral column from side to side. So laterals away from the midline. I can't bend my finger the other direction. Okay, so here are those examples we've just talked about. Um, lateral flexion, you can do that with your neck, bend it to the side, that's lateral away from the midline of your body, and bring it back, okay? Okay, synovial joints by shape, and we're going to have to end with this today. I have a slide after this, we'll end with that, that following slide. And then we, we have just a few slides, like a handful, like maybe five that are over the joints of the upper of the arm. So there's not a lot there. So we can do that in the first 10 minutes of our next class period. Okay, so we can classify oh. joint. Oh, was there a question? Okay, we can classify the synovial joints by their shape by their structure. So we've kind of talked about their shape already. There are six basic shapes to synovial joints. So knowing examples of where you can find these different types of shapes will become important. So the next there's two, the next two slides cover the different shapes and where you can find them. You'll want to make sure you know the major example. When I say major example, I'm talking about the actual picture example that they're talking about. Okay, I'm not gonna pick something that's really obscure. Okay, so an example of gliding joints. So first of all, gliding, this is when you have kind of flat surfaces rubbing past each other. This is limited motion. It's in one axis. It's monoaxial or non-axial. Very small amount of movement. So a place where you would find this would be between your clavicle and your sternum. It's the clavicle, the sternal end of the clavicle is pretty blunt. It's pretty flat and it meets up with the sternum at a pretty, and those two points of the bone at that articulation are pretty flat. And so they glide past each other because you do, you move your arm. If you put your arm on your clavicle and move it, you can feel your clavicle moving. And if you can find the sternal notch right here, or the jugular notch is the other term for it, run your finger up and then start moving your clavicle, moving your shoulder, you can feel where those bones are rubbing past each other, which is kind of cool to be able to feel that gliding joint. Hinge joint, excellent example would be between the humerus and the ulna. We talked a lot about this on Monday. This is an excellent hinge joint. This is the classic example I would ask you the hinge joint. This is in one axis. You cannot twist or bend your elbow. It's not built that way. It moves in one direction. Pivot joints. These are built for rotation only and they're typically in one axis. A good example of a pivot joint would be between the first two cervical vertebra of your vertebral column. 
and they rotate around each other. The other pivot joint, which is more relevant to us at this moment, because we're talking about the arm, is between the radial ulnar joint. So that allows us to do that uh, pronation, supination movement. Okay, ellipsoid joints. This is kind of where you have an oval shaped surface and kind of a concave surface and they are, they're able to move within that depression. So it, it allows it to have some more movement, it, but it's not quite a ball and socket. So a great place to find this would be within the wrist, the carpal bones, okay? So this moves in two planes or it's biaxial. Saddle joint, only one place you can find the saddle joint. Thumb, okay. And it's a pretty unique structure. Think about somebody who's sitting in a saddle. You can slide side to side. You can move forward to back. So you have the ability to move in that saddle in many directions. And you think about the types of movements you can do with your thumb, you can move it opposition, you can flex it, you can extend it, you can adduct it, abduct it, you can circumvent, circumduct it. You have all of these movements because it is a saddle joint. Okay, last ball and socket joints. Two great places you find this, one particularly relevant because we're doing the arm, is the shoulder joint. The head of the humerus fits right into that glenoid cavity or fossa, and you are able to move that at multiple axes. It's multi-axial. Okay, oh, let's see, do we have, let's end with this slide. So joint can be both, cannot be both mobile and strong. There is a trade-off. If it's more mobile, it's giving up some of its strength. Or the less mobile it is, the stronger it is. Mobile joints are supported by muscles, ligaments, um, muscles and ligaments and tendons, not bone to bone connections. So it's relying on accessory structures to help give it more strength. Okay, stopping right here, and this is where we're going to start up our next class period talking about the shoulder joint. Okay, um, are there any questions today before we go? On the syllabus, it says that there's a quiz three that's due today. There should yeah, be. I, actually, I actually emailed you about that earlier. Um, there was no quiz that I see anywhere on campus. I can't okay. find it either. Okay, let me check yeah. right now while we're up in here. That's a, I thought I wrote a quiz, but maybe I forgot. If well, that's, that's okay if you did. <laughs> I figured y'all wouldn't mind too much, but I'm going to check right now. Um, human anatomy quizzes. Did I forget to write a quiz? I did. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll have it do one Friday instead. Okay. Okay? Okay. So Friday by midnight. And I'll have it up by tomorrow. Okay. I'll work on it right now. That one you can that disregard my email what? then. Okay. Okay. Was there another question? What was that over the quiz that's due on Friday? Okay. Let me pull up our schedule. So we're all looking at it together. Um, 
I don't want to tell you wrong. Okay. Oh, it was on the brain and cranial nerves. Okay. So I'm going to work on that right now and it will up, be up either tonight or tomorrow morning, early tomorrow morning, if not tonight. Okay. And I'll send an email out to everybody so that you know when it's ready to go. Okay. Hold on. That's exam one. We I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> well, because okay. I was going off of the dates. The dates. Yes. So there should have been, oh, because what happened is accidentally the brain and head and neck muscles got switched. Okay. So we did head and neck muscles in exam one, and we're doing brain and cranial nerves in exam two. So our quiz is over the brain and cranial nerves, the anatomy. So it's going to be all pictures. Okay. okay. Yeah, no, I was going off September 23rd, quiz three upper appendages, and then 5-1 and 5-2, which isn't due until the 30th, if I remember right. Yeah, it's not a perfect schedule. It, it, some things got switched around on accident, but we are, we're getting back on track. Okay. Um, when it talks about, so right here where it says topic, mm -hmm. um, upper appendages is what we're supposed to be talking about. Okay. It doesn't, it's not the topic of the quiz. Okay. If that helps. So our, it'll be an exam or a quiz? It will be a quiz. Our next mm -hmm. exam is next week. Okay. Yeah. Which will be over brain and cranial nerves, upper appendages, and joints, and vessels, I believe. I'll get back to you on that. I don't want to tell you wrong. Okay. But every, everything we've done after exam one. Okay. So we, we have, we have a lot of topics there for the, our next exam, but for the quiz, it is just brain and cranial nerves and it's identification. Okay. okay. Other questions? Sorry, my computer was dying on me in the middle of the... <laughs> It's no trouble. I knew I saw you on there and when I called Roy, you were gone, but I, I, you're back, so you're good. Yeah, sorry. I had to reboot it like three times to get it to kick back on. Oh, that's frustrating. I'm really sorry. Very. <laughs> I was like, you're going to call Roy and I'm MIA. <laughs> I saw you. You're good. You're good. No worries. Glad you were able to come back and stay on. That's what I get for sitting at the coffee shop, so. <laughs> oh, <laughs> hopefully you were able to enjoy some coffee while you were there. Awesome, awesome. All right, guys, any other questions or comments? Okay, so we're good for tonight. Um, I will send an email out as soon as that quiz is posted. I am very sorry I didn't get it up tonight. Um, I'm going to work on it right away, so either either tonight or early, early tomorrow morning, okay? Thank you for being so cool about it, and I will talk to you guys soon. Have a good night. You too. Thank you.